So, uh, good evening. Let's, let's hope. <laughs> good evening and welcome to the latest installment of the Slack Public Lectures. Um, let me make a few announcements before we begin. Uh, first, if you have a phone, please turn it off. These lectures are recorded and you don't want your ringtone on YouTube forever, right? <laughs> uh, secondly, you notice this beautiful building over here. So, I thank all of you who have been uh, patiently attending the lectures in this relatively small auditorium for the past couple years. But the next one, which will be on November 17th, will be over there in the new Panofsky Auditorium. And it's a much bigger place, so we won't have this registration thing. The next lecture is about dark matter, so tell all your friends. <laughs> okay, tonight um, I'd like to introduce uh, Mike Minitti who's a staff member at Slack. I'll tell you a little about his biography in a moment. He'll be talking about molecular movies. Um, there's been a lot of emphasis in this series on molecular movies, and maybe a little too much hype. We had one public lecture that advertised a molecular movie, and it had two frames. But tonight, the real thing. <laughs> uh, Dr. Minitti uh, has his bachelor's degree from Arizona State University, um, he then got enthusiastic about chemistry, went for a PhD to Brown and eventually to Princeton, uh, came here a few years ago as a postdoc. Now he's the head of the soft X-ray group at the Linac Coherent Light Source that basically makes this kind of physics possible. So he'll show you our new molecular movies. <laughs> Mike, please. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. Thanks. So a show of hands, could you hear me all the way in the back? Everyone's good? Okay, good. Great, because I normally not need this, but uh, I was encouraged to wear it. I talk loud. But uh, yeah, thank you again, Michael, for, for introducing me. And I, it's the honor is, it's really, uh, really a, a fantastic honor to be here, uh, to, to share a really unique uh, a type of uh, accomplishment that we have at this uh, young facility here at the Linux Coherent Light Source. It's just over the hill. Uh, we've only been operating since 2009, and uh, this has been a, a long talk and about to produce a molecular movie of, you know, and, you know having uh, the smallest actors be filmed, and we finally caught that. And so what we see here is kind of what we're going to be talking about, watching this molecule break apart before our eyes. But a little about me first, uh, over to fill into what Michael, Michael was talking about before. Um, uh, I was... I was born and raised in Phoenix, Arizona. I uh, went, to, went to high school, college out in Arizona. Uh, I was always, uh, as, my, as my mom would, would uh, uh, per, uh, attest to, I, I got into everything. Um, uh, I was a, kind of a tricky little kid to, to wrangle up, and I'm, I'm feeling that pain now because of my, my two boys, a 10-month-old and a four-and-a-half-year-old, take, take after me. And it's, uh, it's it, believe me, it comes in spades. And uh, so, but uh, my, my, I, I, to tell you a story, back when I was uh, quite young, uh, my, my, my family owned a restaurant. And back in the day, I got a, a salt shaker and some ice. And I found out, I put some salt on this ice, that really cool things happened, that this thing got really rock hard and it got really cold. And as a kid, I wanted to, you know, be a good chemist and scale up. And so I put a lot of salt in the ice maker of our restaurant. It did not go over well. Uh, so, but, but first, yeah, it, was, uh, it, was, it was a little tricky. I got out of it. But even then, even before I really even knew it, I got a little spark to, I, I liked chemistry. I figured it out. Then I made my way to high school. I got aged a little bit, got a little bit older, somewhat wiser, and I made my way to McClintock High School in Tempe, and I met this man. This man's Doc Zinke. This is the guy who got me into chemistry, why I'm in a chemist today. Um, he was a, a, a grizzled Pencil, a Western Pennsylvania man. Uh, he was a basketball coach. I did not play basketball. I played baseball. But uh, four years earlier than that, my sister walked into his classroom, into his general science and physics chemistry. And so he already he knew of like, what Minettis are coming down the line. And so my mom, being a really good baker, does anyone know what that is? Pitzel. That's right. So yeah, so uh, you know, being you know, Italian in heritage, uh, Doc Zinke, growing up in Western Pennsylvania, uh, he had this great comment to me. It was, Minetti, 
your grade is directly proportional to the amount of pit cells you bring me. <laughs> and so I brought him a lot of pit cells. But in the case, he gave me a lot. It, it, his, his class opened up my eyes to chemistry. And going into, going into chemistry, or I'm sorry, going into university, I knew I wanted to be a chemist from day one. So I made myself, I made my way over to Arizona State University uh, by way of uh, a community college uh, prior to that playing baseball. Uh, playing baseball throughout. And then at Arizona State, I made a, uh, uh, I got con connected with a, a majoring in chemistry. No, I wanted to do this. Uh, I got connected with a, a professor by the name of Tim Steinley, and he got me turned on to lasers and how lasers interact with molecules and do produce and, and probe and look at chemistry. Now, it was a little bit different types of lasers and all these pretty cute lasers and all this other stuff. And it was uh, eye-opening to see the world of quantum, quantum chemistry and the real world meld and come together, all initiated and probed by lasers. Uh, up until last Saturday, I would have said ASU is going to win the Pac-12, but with the slacking against USC, I'm going to leave that be. Uh, but after ASU, I made my way over to, uh, to Brown University, uh, again, kind of a circuitous route to, through Stony Brook, starting grad school. Got my PhD at Brown University, where I met a guy named Peter Weber, and we'll talk a little bit more about that tonight with him. Uh, and this project that we did making a molecular movie. Uh, at Brown, I got turned on to a world of bigger and badder lasers. These things are great. These are called ultra-fast lasers, and we'll talk about ultra-fast science and what they produce. They were great. And so I got to play the, with the biggest and the baddest lasers around. Uh, taking that knowledge with my PhD, I made, made my way over to Princeton University, did a postdoc there under Herschel Rabbits, and I made my way over to Slack uh, Accelerator National Laboratory here. Uh, as, as Michael said, I'm a staff scientist, chemist by trade, run a soft x-ray group. Uh, so if you, if you all come over to uh, Slack or LCLS for a tour, uh, our little area that I'm kind of in charge in is the first hutches, one and two, the blue and the gray hutches. If you ever come in, I'll be happy to, happy to give you a tour. So what we'll talk about today is kind of like, again, chemistry and, the, and what really interests me when I was getting my PhD and working on my postdoc was looking at in chemistry uh, all around us and how these, Im how these chemical reactions are important uh, to our everyday lives and the kind of the chemical reactions that these things undergo uh, makes it uh, very unique to why we're here as a human uh, and we'll get to that right, and why you're looking at me right now and why you're seeing what I'm, what I'm presenting. Um, and then the cool thing is the hardware, the newest ways to, make it, to, to look at chemistry in real time. This is what I'm going to talk about, the Linac coherent light source. It's the, it's the biggest, baddest tool around. Now I said I really liked lasers before. This is the best laser we, you, you got. It's pretty much the best one in the world. And then lastly, I'm going to t teach you and instruct about how we use these fancy Hollywood tricks to capture the smallest actors around. Uh, these things are very, very small. We'll go, we'll go about uh, talking how this works. But, uh, you know, late, uh, chemistry and vision, uh, what we see here, yeah, as, you, as a result of uh, a simple chemical reaction that was light initiated, so we kind of see around, uh, if we see this little light, uh, the sun, the sun is all colors, all these different types of colors, all from the ultraviolet to, the echo, to, uh, to, 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 to infrared. But we're really going to concentrate on a visible spectrum. You can see me, I can see you. Uh, this little chemical reaction with this molecule called retinol is undergoing a structural change. And this structural change initiated by the absorption of a, some a visible light photons allows you to see. It switches basically on and off. The ability uh, when light hits the, the molecule here in one state, there's a chemical reaction or a little small, tiny, tiny little structural change of can make you see me and me see you. And this little green laser pointer up there uh, pointing the way. Uh, but we're going to, we, 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 we'll talk about a little bit different, uh, a different type of reaction, um, one like with here. And so light is all over the place. There's a large electromagnetic spectrum across, and only that small, tiny little sliver is a small part that we can actually see, the visible light. Uh, but when we talk about um, the, this very, very important reaction of why, uh, kind of why, uh, why the human race is where we are right now, is the production of vitamin D. Uh, and this, again, is initiated by the sun. So this is how you produce vitamin D in your skin. Uh, without it, we would be goners because uh, we would, uh, our DNA would, uh, would, would, not, would, not, would not last. And so what would happen is instead of looking at something where the retinol in your eye does a structural change to look at, uh, to, to make you see or not, to turn that switch, there's a, 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 an, an energy, energy regime uh, called the ultraviolet. You guys see this on your lotions, the suntan lotions, UVA, UVB. I don't think there's a UVC, but in any case, uh, uh, lotion, that is. 
There's definitely UVC type light, but uh, <laughs> that's for a fact. <laughs> um, but we, uh, so the, this reaction under what the, the vitamin D is produced is a, a tiny, tiny structural change. There's a little bond breaking right here. Uh, when the light is shined upon this molecule, the molecule absorbs light in this region, it pops open. And that, 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 that reaction right there, that light-driven chemistry, uh, makes us produce vitamin D. That's why we're here. Uh, and so again, but what if we, you know, to try to study this type of molecule, it's going to be quite hard. It's pretty big. Uh, it's kind of hard to work with. Uh, it really likes light, so it's, uh, you've got to keep it dark. So if you can kind of just focus in on take all the other stuff that's around that molecule uh, and simplify it a lot and try to make, uh, make sense of why this molecule undergoes this light-driven reaction. To try to, to start, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day, so this was the first step in this, and so we wanted to shrink this molecule, uh, shrink the example down uh, and to, to look at and try to make sense of it. So if you look at this, does this molecule look somewhat like this? And the molecule that we see here is cyclohexadiene. Uh, this is the target molecule that we actually made the molecular movie with. Um, and I, you know, like, like, like any good uh, movie producer, you always want to have a teaser. And so, if I can find the mouse. So this is actually what the molecule's doing. When we shine ultraviolet laser light upon it, just like the sun shines light on vitamin D, the vitamin D molecule unravels, and we are able to watch this molecule unravel. This is a series of chemical reactions called uh, electrocyclic chemical reactions. Back in the day, uh, two guys by the name of Woodward and Hoffman were organic chemists. They pioneered a way to a whole slew of different types of, uh, of chemical reactions governed by how rings either open or close. And so these are uh, two Nobel Prizes off this uh, very important type of reaction. So now we're actually, instead of using a solvent, we're using, uh, some photo, uh, we're using light to shine upon it and break that bond open and watch this thing unravel because it was, it was known when the light was shined upon it, when the molecule was closed, uh, when the light hit it, it knew it opened, but no one knew kind of how it opened. So this is what we're filming, is how it's opening. And so again, my favorite section, I always like gadgets and I like tools and toys and all her stuff, so the way we make molecular movies now, it's the really fun part, the hardware. The hardware is where it gets good. And so to, to measure these type of the smallest actors around uh, in, a, in a small six carbon member ring, uh, we need a really fast strobe of light, a really bright x-ray source. X-rays are great for measuring molecular structure because their wavelength uh, is much shorter than what we saw in the ultraviolet regime. But they're, uh, so they're very tuned to measuring the molecular structure by looking at the electrons and the, and, and the atoms inside the molecule all at once. So back in 2009, the Linac coherent light source was built. And so here we are, we're sitting basically right about here in this building. Uh, and if you're, if you're familiar with, uh, we're looking northward, this is Highway 280. This is a three kilometer long linear accelerator. That linear accelerator, uh, in, in the terms of LCLS, we only use the last third of it. And so right about here. Uh, and so the fun fact is, what was here first, 280 or, lin or, 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 uh, or the linear accelerator? The linear accelerator was here first. They built Highway 280 over it. Uh, and the bridge. <laughs> That's right, and so uh, it's kind of crazy. They have a really super stable piece of, piece, piece of rock out there in case we have a big, a big, uh, a big earthquake. So we're pretty safe, thank God, because <laughs> eventually it will come. So, but basically what we did was we retrofitted this, 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 old, this aging LINAC and we were able to create uh, the world's brightest X-ray source. It's never seen before, a billion times, to 10 billion times brighter than any X-ray source known to man. We did it here using this linear accelerator, creating electrons, and creating, uh, creating x-rays, which we'll see here. Uh, and I said the capabilities have just never been, never seen before. Uh, it's opening up all new types of chemistry, physics, material science, biological studies, crystallographic studies. You name it, this, this source can do it. And how do we do it? We have, a, uh, an, uh, again, an ultraviolet laser pulse, similar to the ones that we utilize in our study, train itself sitting in this little building here at the tip of the sword, if you would, shooting an ultraviolet laser port, uh, 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 pulse onto a piece of copper. It's a copper cathode. When the ultraviolet light strikes that copper cathode, that copper cathode emits a pocket of electrons. We gather those electrons, and then once we gather those electrons, we shuttle them down this linear accelerator to about right here. And now you're looking down the barrel of a free electron laser. 
as, as, as we're right about here in this acceleration phase where we just created the, the, the electrons, now we need to accelerate those electrons to 99.9999 some odd percent, and they go, they, go, they go quite fast. But that's not what we want. We wanted x-rays, remember? We don't want electrons. We wanted to use, study molecular reactions using x-rays to probe its molecular structure as, as it evolves. Now, you could do it with electrons, uh, but not in this case. We're, uh, we're, 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 we're happy to do it uh, with, with the x-rays. And so if I can find my mouse again, how do we create those x-rays? Well, these electrons are now, if you are right about in this phase, after they boosted up their energies, after being kind of rolled down this hill as a marble, these electrons are going super duper fast. Now they enter what's called an undulator. These are north, these are magnetic poles, of, these are magnets sitting north and south, one another, separated by a few millimeters. And as the electron zooms through this, this, this undulator or these alternating magnetic fields, they begin to wiggle. And when they wiggle, the X-ray, or so the, the electrons give off X-rays each kind of round trip. And as these X-rays burn off uh, uh, the energy, they in interact with one another. And the electron and the X-rays pile together in sheets. They bunch together, boosting the X-ray energy every time a little round trip or oscillation. So now we have a whole pocket of X-rays and electrons together. Again, we don't want to use the electrons. We want to use the X-rays. So we have these two big, super duper powerful magnets. You do not want to stand next to them. Credit cards will be erased. Uh, they're really dangerous. But uh, we, did, we discard those electrons into effectively a large piece of you know, lead in the ground. We just burn them off. And the x-rays have no polarity, uh, in term, or no, uh, no, no polarity, so they don't see that field. So they just go right through it. And then these um, exit off to the experimental end stations where we perform science. And the, and the big magnet, they just goes away. The, the, the electrons go to rest. It's not a lot of charge there. but. Um, it's a, so we couldn't harvest that electronic energy. Uh, it comes too short. There's not enough charge. But why LCLS? So if you go to the, the, the LCLS website, just uh, on any one of the, on the Slack websites here, uh, especially this Slack website, and it's, a, it's conveniently called Why LCLS? Uh, and so it, <laughs> it is, um, it's why were we going to build this great facility? And this is what avenues, what can we open up and the type of science that we can look into? Well, on this, on this website, it shows... Uh, well, you know, these are recently results in very great high publication, uh, high visibility journals in nature and physical chemistry letters and uh, physical, physical review letters and, and science. Everyone's kind of heard of these type of, uh, of, 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 of publications. And so here we actually are looking at a structural change of, look, of watching when uh, a, uh, something in your brain is firing and telling something to move or telling something to, uh, like, like an enzyme firing or synapse across your nerves. You can actually watch this structural change and as, as you can make you basically feel as a synapse of firing your, uh, 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 pardon me, it's a, um, as, your, as your nerves fire across the synapse, you can watch a structural change of how you're actually feeling. Or you can look at live things in situ. You can look at as uh, viruses, proteins, peptides be intersected by this ultra bright x-ray source. And the, in, in, the, in the blink of an eye, that x-ray source takes a picture of it before it's completely destroyed, eradicated, it goes away. Uh, in this case, the last, uh, the last public lecture was actually given by uh, uh, a co uh, a colleague of mine. He was a postdoc here uh, in the Symes Institute by the name of Jerry LaRue. And in this, in this type of study, instead of watching a chemical bond break, in which we are watching here in filming a molecular movie, they actually watch one form uh, on the surface of ruthenium. So they watch the CO molecule form while on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on a ruthenium surface, something very similar that goes on inside your car when you drove over here. But last but not least, what really uh, makes me excited and why we're here tonight is like this last bit of uh, this last bit of line that was on. If you go to this website, it says the study of molecular motion in response to light and other chemical triggers, and to compile a movie of the of the of these changes. Well, I'm glad to say that we actually can do that now. And so uh, we were watching this, and this is our paper that recently just came out in uh, just uh, earlier this year. And so, well, how do we do this? First, as Michael said. Um, there was a, a, very, a very large uh, hype when this facility was first being built of like, how can we make a molecular movie? We, we wanted to use this ultra-bright x-ray source to take snapshots and photographs of molecules in action and chemical reactions as they occur. All the way, so now we find ourselves in 2015, over 10 years ago was the first mention of, t of molecular movies. In one of the talks, and a really good talk by Phil Buxbaum. I was a professor here at Stanford at Slack. 
and we're talking about how molecular movies. So you can kind of see, uh, even, you know, it's like I said, nine to ten years ago, it's the hype. Hell, there, there was a molecular movie public lecture that was, was saying this is the making of a molecular movie. Uh, it was a great talk by Kelly Gaffney, another professor here, and it's showing the importance of what we're, why we're here tonight to see what we're going to see tonight. Uh, and a, all, a lot of friends and colleagues and, and gave, these, uh, gave these talks. Uh, and to, 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 be, to remember, we only turned on, delivered at our first x-rays only six years ago. So even long before that first delivery of these ultra-bright x-rays, were there, were, there, were there mention of, of molecular movies. So if you guys are familiar with Stanford and they have a long legacy of kind of making movies, uh, no, you wouldn't have thought that. You know, all that stuff happens down south in L.A. and Beverly Hills. But uh, back in the day, in the late 1800s, Edward Moybridge, uh, uh, Leland Stanford Jr. asked Edward Moybridge to film a horse. He wanted to see if this horse ever left uh, when it's, uh, at any one time when its hoofs got off the ground, were the hooves kind of splayed out outside, uh, uh, not underneath the horse, or the, horse, uh, the horse's hoofs underneath the horse? Well, this is a long-standing question. So to devise this type of, uh, of, of, of film, they had a, a devised a series of uh, a trip wires that this horse ran across. And basically, at the, at the end of this trip wire was a camera. And as the horse ran across that trip wire, smash, took a picture. And so it was just a strobiscopic still view of a horse. But if you start to put motion to that, you get to see a horse running. It's only about 16 frames, but we all see the horse's hooves are up underneath it as it's galloping when it's off the ground. Otherwise, it's, it's running and sprinting. But to take a camera, uh, you get, if, if there's any avid photographers here, we have, you have to have a shutter speed for your camera. In order to catch something moving, you need something that's faster or equally fast to catch it, to make it nice and clear in view, just like they did with this horse. So if it's one thousandth of a second or a millisecond is a, is, was the ability at the time, that was the technology, to capture, uh, open and close, and let this picture uh, gather onto this film. So the shutter speed in this instance was just a millisecond. Very impressive for 1878 or something like that. But, you know, it's, uh, but if we want to take pictures of atoms and molecules, milliseconds ain't going to work. Well, uh, in the advent, uh, cameras got better, tech got better. But we now need to, now if you picture this, uh, if anyone's seen this on TV, uh, of how these, uh, you know, how they do it, and did, uh, did someone assassinate Kennedy with one magic bullet, and they, they, they shoot these guns, and these bullets are zooming through the air. You can see the bullets move in, 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 on, on screen. So in order to do that, you know, a horse shrunken down to the size of a bullet, a bullet is much, much faster. If you shoot a bullet, it will beat the horse every time, right? Uh, <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna to go move a lot faster. And so in order to capture this miraculous little film of this bullet ripping through an apple or a bullet ripping through a bottle of water, to see it clearly as it's going through everything, you need a millionth of a second shutter time. And that's three orders of magnitude difference, so it's, it's a thousandth of a thousandth. And so that's really fast, a millionth of a second. But atoms and molecules move a lot faster than that. So we need a shutter speed to capture a molecular movie on this. This is called a femtosecond. This is exactly what the Linac coherent light source can produce. We can produce X-ray pulses, like camera shutters, like shutter speeds on your camera, but in the X-ray regime, we're taking a, a kind of like a big X-ray camera. And this is a millionth of a billionth of a second. So 15 orders of magnitude smaller. Or it, this, is, this is 15 zeros in front of this one. It is an extremely, extremely small sliver of time. And, uh, but thankfully, we have the tech. Like I said, tech always gets better. And as tech's going to get better here soon, I'll, at, on our last slide, we'll talk about it in, in a little bit. But to put this to perspective, if one femtosecond were one minute, that is to say that one minute is the age of the universe. Get your, it's, it's, a, it's pretty, pretty small, small sliver of time. Uh, it's, it's, it's fantastically small. So if only one minute was one femtosecond, then one minute is the age of the universe. But not only are molecules move really fast, and they're, they zoom all over the place, they also are extremely small. And so x-rays are on the wavelength. Uh, their oscillation or their period or their frequency uh, is, is in, in, again, it's, it's x-ray, so they call it an x-ray, but their wavelength's about the, an angstrom or so. Uh, and it, and the, this angstrom in, uh, in, in length scale is 10 billionths of a meter. What's 10 billionths of a meter? I mean, what, do we even know? Like, can, we, can we put a scale to that? 
But so in angstrom, like I said, x-rays are, are unique probes of molecular structure, so the molecular structure would like something of its similar size to interrogate it, if not smaller. So in this case, uh, this is the molecule that we looked at, our cyclohexadiene molecule, and from basically from bond to bond, it's about three angstroms, three ten billionths of a meter. Well, that's tiny, how tiny? If you were to make that larger by a million times, it would only be the size of the width of your hair. Your hair is about 100 microns in diameter. So if you go a million times greater, that hair, that, so now you have one molecule is the width of your hair. So that still doesn't really put it in perspective. So, because it's not such a macroscopic thing. You know, I, like me, I don't have any hair. Consider you guys uh, lucky. <laughs> and so I can't do this experiment. So I had to sit there and think of what was, what's the next best thing. So if we put some scale to it, this little match, all right, so this little match is about almost two inches long, 5.2 centimeters. Uh, and so if we were to make this a million times bigger, what would it be? Anyone? Huge. Huge is good. <laughs> Huge is good. Uh, that's Mount Everest. Pretty big, right? It's actually six times Mount Everest. We have orders of magnitude. We have six orders of magnitude difference in height. So a million of these stacked on top of one another, six Mount Everests. That's how small molecules are. <laughs> and so, again, this just blows my mind of how small this thing is. <laughs> small and fast uh, doesn't cut it. These are ultra small and ultra fast. So it's mind blown. Like any good scientist, he, he has a, I, I, I'm not wearing my, uh, my, my uh, turtleneck. But he's a good scientist there. He's got his turtleneck. His mind is blown. So we now know what the, what the hardware is. We know what the chemistry is, what we want to look at. We want to look at light-driven chemistry. Now we know how to do it. We have the tools. We have this big, beautiful X-ray laser to probe uh, these molecular structures in time. Well, now we can employ some Hollywood tricks. Uh, they're kind of slick. Uh, and like any good movie nowadays, it's got to have some good CG. We have that. And so what did we look at? We know what that molecule is, that cyclohexadiene. So this is cyclohexadiene, six-membered ring. And it was well known that when you shine light upon it, I said this earlier, when you shine light upon it, it opens up. But what wasn't known is how fast it opened up and how it opened up and actually kind of what happened within these two, uh, these two question marks. And now that we all know what a femtosecond is, it to go from a, a, a closed ring molecule to something that's splayed out and open it was only 80 femtoseconds. Pretty, pretty fast. Again, pretty small, things move pretty fast. And so to use x-rays, um, there's a multiple techniques that one can use uh, to look at this x-ray spectroscopy, x-ray absorption, but we use x-ray scattering or diffraction. Might, you might have, you might have uh, heard it by a different name. Uh, we call it scattering because uh, what we are looking at is a molecule in the gas phase, just kind of like we are here, breathing gas like this. Uh, diffraction tends to be more of like a very ordered structure, like a piece of metal, right, or a crystal. But in this case, I like to call x-ray scattering because it's all this, like this gas all over the place. It's like playing molecular billiards. And so we have an x-ray detector as like acts as a catcher or the pocket that the ball is going to go into. Our little cyclohexadiene molecule populates a little cell. The x-rays come in in that big white pulse. I'll play this again because it went a little fast. And the, as the x-rays progress through that molecule, they scatter off all the little tidbits inside of there that make up the bonds of these carbons. The carbon bonds to the hydrogen. And on top of that, there's a bunch of electrons zooming around this, 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 this molecule. So the x-ray interacts with kind of all of them, Maj majority with the electrons. But we also get a little interaction uh, with, with, with the bigger stuff, if you will. Again, so the x-rays pro propagate through the molecule and they scatter off. And the, where they land on this big kind of catcher is very meaningful. And so where, these, where this kind of x-ray scatter upon it, I, I always like to say it, it looks like it, someone sneezed on the detector. And so it's not these like cool little dots. It's just something like a, a very large powdery pattern. Uh, as that powdery pattern, but if you look at it on one thing, it looks kind of... Uh, rings and waves. But the position of those crests of those waves and wiggles are very meaningful. And this is what we tried to use some of our slick CG to figure out. But what we have showed there, we just showed the molecule standing on its own, the cyclohexadiene molecule. Well, 
we, if you remember the slide, a few slides prior, the cyclohexadiene molecule is just kind of sitting there and it diffracts. Well, we know that the molecule, we know what the structure looks like. We know it's not opening. We know it's not doing anything. We need to put some motion to this molecule. We need to kind of kick it. And so there's a technique, a very sciencey technique called pump probe, optical or UV laser light pump, optical or x-ray probe. You can use different types of lasers for the type of molecule that you want to inter uh, interrogate. But there's always an optical laser or UV laser exciting the molecule, making it do something. And then we take some x-ray photograph of it. So think of a pump as an excitation. And the x-ray in this case is a photograph. So remember, we're going to scatter off this molecule and take a picture. So when the, when the excitation, if you guys have kids, uh, you know, if you give your child some sugar, you excite them. But they don't really act right after you feed them sugar, right? They're just, they're kind of, they're, they're, they're in a steady state. Get some time across. So when the excitation, and then you want to take a picture of them in an excited state, well, the molecule's not really doing anything. So it kind of looks like it was in itself it's by its ground state. There's nothing going on with the molecule. It's interesting, but it's a static structure. We'll let that sugar set in, and we come in with a UV pulse. In this case, we're not going to shine UV light on our children. That would be bad. But... Uh, <laughs> Well, when we come in at some time earlier, the UV pulse excites the molecule. The molecule starts to wiggle and wrangle and all this other good stuff. And at some time delay later, we take a photograph of, that, of the molecule in action with the x-ray. And our molecule looks a little something different because it got excited. And that, it, the excitation was able to propagate through. Well, if we do this again, just like the horse running through tripwires, if you lengthen the distance of the tripwires, you're going to get a different gait of the horse. In this case, now the UV light comes much before the X-ray pulse. The molecule changes its shape again. We come and take a picture of it. And so this is kind of how you sew this uh, story together. You do this multiple times for multiple events, and you get to get the form of movie. Let's, uh, I always lose the mouse. So this is how we did it. There's our detector again. And this time, we have a vessel with our, with our cyclohexadiene molecule in it. It populates, the molecule sits there and populates the, uh, the vessel. Optical laser pulse comes in, excites the molecule, breaks it. The red x-ray pulse comes in and, and takes a picture. So now if we just like, just like taking a picture of a horse, the optical laser excites, the x-ray probe takes a picture. We do this over and over and over again for many, many tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of shots. Again, knowing that, that what is caught and captured on that big detector is very meaningful. So now if you sew these things together, the molecule begins to move, these still frames become motion, and that motion becomes a movie. And so the experimental results, what does it look like? Uh, you know, we saw, the, we saw the, with the, the, the movie itself, but again, like, a, like, like any other good, uh, a good type of uh, a, a blockbuster, there's some CG involved, so you gotta, you gotta involve a computer. <laughs> so if in this case, this is the actual measure, the, the signal that we measured. And in that measured signal, so it doesn't look like a, that doesn't look like a molecule at all. And so if you look at the, through time of how this, mo how, how the, 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 how the x-ray scatter on that big catcher detector, the x-ray camera, if you will, as we saw those rings, uh, and the positions of those rings, uh, like I said, are very meaningful. If you just looked at like, all the signal on that detector, it would change through time and give you a funny shape like this. So the flat line was when it wasn't excited. It wasn't excited. And then at some time, to get, some time delay later, the x-ray takes a picture. And that, that pattern is changing. Let's look at that again. But what is, that cha what, what is this telling us? These kind of wiggles. It goes from a flat line to some type of wiggling pattern. Well, in each of these little slices in time, we have over 10,000 individual frames. So. It, there's some, some have more, some have less, uh, but on average, it's about 10,000 shots. And each time step that we were able to bin it down to, like the smallest time that we can look at, was about 25 femtoseconds. So in each of these 25 femtosecond slivers of time, we have about 10,000 x-ray shots. And then what we plot here is the average of those 10,000 shots in any given time. And this is, what, this is kind of what you see as this molecule, as the structure, the component that you measure on the detector changes. Well, these wiggles that we tell you about, something goes up and something comes down and something goes back up, these, we these wiggles are very, 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 very meaningful. 
they tell you something about where the atoms are in relationship to the electrons and all this other good stuff. And that, where, we, as you can tell where the electrons go, uh, the atoms aren't very far behind. So it tells you something about the structure. So these wiggles are actually meaningful because as this molecule opens up, these, uh, these, what tells you that where the wiggles lie on this detector, the wiggles here, it tells you something about distances if, if, if let me back up, if the, if, if the, if the distance of the molecule, all these different length scales play and interact with one another. And they, they have like a fingerprint on this spectrum here, what you measure on the scattered signal. And so things that are very close to one another happen very far onto the right side at a larger uh, interactive distance. Things that are happen uh, far from one another are closer in, are closer in this, res res it's, a, it's a harder term, it's an inverse of a length. And so the things that are farther away from one another will appear closer on your detector. But they all play together and they all interact together. So what happens is they become smeared out a little bit. And so, but we have to try to tease out how that smearing occurs to get all these interactions and try to know them by heart and how it best fits and represents the molecular structure that we see on our detector. Well, we need to optimize it. This is where our slick CG comes in. And so we have all these tens of thousands of shots that we look on the detector. And if we want to model each of these snapshots and see what the molecular structure actually looks like. And so when we compare it to the experiment to the theory, this is what we see here. We calculate uh, the bond distances between the bond that breaks when it got excited by the ultraviolet laser pulse. And we watch the distance of these atoms move apart. And this is this axis here. And so we, we tell the computer, monitor these two points. Here's some energy. Go. And we let the molecule do its thing. And we do this for many, 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 many thousands of events. And so we see all these different types of trajectories. And all this is saying it, each of these are kind of unique individual experiments performed in a computer. And these tell us something about the structure of the molecule. Because if you go across one line versus another line, well, the distances between these two carbon atoms aren't necessarily the same. But what does that look like in the picture that you're trying to take and simulate? Well, with, if you were to walk across one of these lines and then look at the scattering signal that you would see on a detector, it might look something like this. If you go on another one, it might look something like this. They're drastically different. So even if you take a very small difference, uh, different path of how the molecule can open up, the signal that you see, all these wiggles on the detector, change dramatically. Well, we don't care necessarily about these. We care about this one. This is the one that we measured. So we want to see what does our computer tell us if we measure this signal, what is the path that this molecule can take to look like our detected signal? That's the most interesting one. That's the one we're measuring. Again, there's a little bit of error bars. We'll get to that later. But here we go. We spit one out. The computer said, voila. The CG happened. And we found that if you can kind of see, compare, basically, this is, again, what we measured on the detector at LCLS. And this is what we kind of com computed. Well, it turns out that it's basically a little bit of a mixture of some predominant trajectories. And these trajectories are these lines. And if you distill how, if you let these molecules go, you tell it, excite, boom, unravel, and see what happens. These molecules tend to go on these bigger, darker lines. These darker lines have more weight or more probability. There is more chance the molecule is going to follow these paths to open up. You also notice that sometimes it doesn't open up. That can't happen. It's a quantum mechanical system. Crazy things decide not to open, not close. They can close, open, we all do it back again. And it actually does. You can kind of see some of the trajectories that actually move. And so about half, uh, about uh, you know, uh, close to 40% uh, kind of open up in these two purple and red lines, whereas the another about 30 or 40% 30 don't open. But all the small dashed lines do mean something. There's about 5 to 6% probability or chance in each of those lines that the molecule will open. And you see that all those dashed lines, they tend to the molecule goes open. And so it could technically follow one of those paths, theoretically. And so uh, the, the ratio of which uh, um, is a, was an outstanding issue for if you looked at some uh, uh, liquid chemists, uh, you know, more organic chemists, they would say, oh, it's about half the time it opens up. Uh, if you looked at uh, gas phase chemists like myself uh, and, and, and who you know, interrogate molecules with lasers, 
uh, we would say it's about 90% of the time. Um, I believe it's still 90% of the time because other type of spectroscopic measurements using optical lasers uh, say so. Um, and I can tell you why, how we can try to solve that problem and we really come to some closure a little bit later. But we can do it, we can uh, look at each of those little trajectories, those blue, purple, red, and yellow trajectories, and these are what the molecular structures are doing as you walk across those lines. As this molecule opens up, it closes back down, and this is what we're, what we're saying, uh, that is, these are routes that the molecule can actually take. The one that we actually see that you saw kind of the surface on was closer to, that, uh, was closer to the purple one. But that was the, that was the, the, the closest, uh, closest to what we have measured. So if you measure that again, so we got to see our computer-enhanced CGI graphics of a molecular motion uh, happening in the, from start to finish, from, the, from this, when this movie starts to this movie ends, is 200 femtoseconds. It's not very long. So it's a short movie. That's nice. But how do we do better? How do we get a better movie? How do we make a better movie? We always need, you know, we can't, uh, we don't want to start off, you know, we, you know, Star Wars coming up. J.J. Abrams better get it right. I'm a big Star Wars fan, like all, all most scientists. They got, you better get it right. Can't have another Jar Jar Binks. <laughs> uh, so how do we produce a better movie? Like I said, we were working in the gas phase. So here we're breathing nitrogen and oxygen and argon, all this other stuff. These molecules are tumbling around while knocking into one another. Uh, so it's not like a liquid or a, a, where liquid molecules can move around too, but it's something like a solid, like a table, where it's really hard, where there's a structure to it. These molecules are tumbling around. So if you can picture if the molecule is running around either being intercepted by the laser and it has an orientation like this or like this or like this or like this, it tends to smear out. The molecule is not teed up like a golf ball sitting there waiting just to be hit by this x-ray. So if you can find a way and devise a way to tee up this, mo uh, to tee up this molecule just like a golf ball and let it sit there and let it interact with the laser light, the UV light, and the x-ray pulse, you'll have a better way to resolve the spaces in between those carbons. Remember we showed the carbon opened up, or the, the, the molecule opened up, and all those dashed lines and saying this interaction plays with this and there is this distance. It would better clarify those interactions. And that's called spatial resolution. So it's like, how close can you resolve your nearest neighbor? And so the optical, uh, the UV laser pulse uh, excites that molecule. So if you allow that UV laser pulse to come in a shorter amount of time, more coherent energy is directed into the degrees of freedom that the molecule wants to open up. And it's just like a, a sharper camera. The excitation becomes at a, sh uh, the excitation of, that, uh, of the molecule happens in a shorter amount of time. And so you can get these X-ray pulses and the UV pulses closer together to see the really early events. And that helps our spatial resolution uh, between the, the X-ray pulse and the, uh, and, and the UV pulse. Same can be said for the X-ray pulse. Actually, we have this capability already here at LCLS. Um, we can generate laser X-ray pulses on the order of about two femtoseconds, two to three femtoseconds. Uh, in this experiment that we used here, they were about 30 femtoseconds. So the total time resolution of our camera, or the actual shutter speed, is a mix between how fast the laser pulse is and how fast the X-ray pulse is. So the combination of those give you the ultimate time resolution that you can see. And we have about 80 femtoseconds. So if we can make those time series smaller and our time resolution will get much better and much faster, we have better temporal resolution. So we can see the earliest events happen and really get a, get a, get a handle on how this molecule unravels. And when you do simpler molecules, like the molecule that we chose with cyclohexadiene, that molecule can lend uh, it's easier to handle computationally. So if you have a molecule that somewhat has not as many atoms and not as many electrons, the, co the computers tend to, tend to chomp on that data a little bit faster, right? You know, Silicon Valley here is all about data reduction. You need to have you know, big computers to do big work. And so when you start trying to me measure uh, molecular structure, there's a lot of electrons and there's a lot of things to chomp on. So we, if, we do perfor if we perform uh, easier, more typical molecules, more guinea pig molecules, we'll have a better idea of how to better the codes that ultimately will play into looking at how peptides, proteins, uh, viruses, how these type of things unravel when they interact and play with and be interrogated with ultra-bright x-rays. So what are the next steps? Thankfully, <laughs> my team and I uh, got more beam time at LCLS. 
Uh, we're very happy with this. Uh, it's pretty hard. Uh, it's, a, it's a very oversubscribed facility. Uh, about one in five and one or six proposals ever get accepted. Uh, it's, it's, it's big business. And even working here, I don't get, I don't get, I don't get the right carpet. We don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't get the ability to use it as, uh, on willy-nilly. So back uh, in, in January 2016, we're going to do exactly that. We're going to try to improve our spatial resolution. And so this is, uh, we learned some tricks on, on the data that we just showed today on how to better uh, the, I would say, the error bars or the resolution around one of these wiggles uh, to better that. Uh, and so that's, that's, that's going to be the attempt. But again, when these wiggles, they, they, they keep telling you about these wiggles and it's all about the interactions and interplays of, uh, of, of molecules against, say, one carbon across another carbon chain or things really close to one another. If you can widen the window to tell you about the stuff that interacts really close, if, the, if these atoms are very close to one another, the more wiggles, the better. That tells you more spatial information about the nearest neighbor atoms and how they interact with one another. So if you open that window up and use more or energetic x-rays, it tells you more about the structure of the molecule. And that gets, a, gets you a better feel for what the molecule is actually doing. In, in another case, we're going to expand our target molecules and look at other interesting biological molecules and methylmorphine. I, if you want to, I'll if you talk about it all the, uh, uh, not, enough time in, uh, not enough time in this talk to, to tell you about it, but uh, it's quite interesting uh, structural dynamics. Uh, and again, when you start small, and like again, Rome wasn't built in a day, so when you start small, these molecules help feed these powerful computational, these programs and algorithms to get, it to, to get us to where we need to look at the biggest structure molecules of really interesting things like peptides, peptides and proteins. And then LCLS2. I tell you all about LCLS. It's, it is an, absolutely, an absolute joy, and it's just crazy to work here to look at the type of science that we get to see. Day in and day out, your job is always changing as a staff scientist. But LCLS2 is, 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 a, is a game changer again. We're changing, again, the game of what we kind of created here with a free electron laser. Here at LCLS, in one second, we have about 120 x-ray pulses arrive at our samples in one second. Now, these samples are super bright. They come in very small slivers of time. LCLS2 will open that uh, capability up to put a million laser pulses within one second. So the type of statistics or the number of shots that you know, I showed you, oh, we had 10,000 shots in this sliver of time, you could do that in a tenth of a second even less than that. <laughs> it's, uh, it's amazing that the, the type of capabilities that this instrument's going to have, and it's going to even be brighter x-rays coming in a lot, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of pulses in a short amount of time. It's, it's going to be changing. So you're going to see a lot of construction going on here uh, starting soon. Uh, and 2020 is uh, hopefully when we turn on. Uh, so just imagine all the type of science. Uh, so I think I want to lay the claim in saying this is the first mention of LCLS2 maybe. I, I <laughs> So maybe in 10 years' time, we'll come and uh, someone will show my picture up there with, uh, this is someone talked about LCLS2. Um, with like any good uh, scientific uh, uh, collaboration, it takes a village, uh, because there's a lot of working parts. And first and foremost, we uh, collaborative, like uh, our, our PIs are Peter Weber and Jerry Hastings. Peter was my PhD advisor back at Brown. And coupled with a great grad student in James Budars, uh, who's finishing up the last results that we have uh, on another molecular movie uh, using uh, diodobenzene. Uh, that data is coming out, so we'll uh, be publishing that soon. It's another molecular movie from the similar type of reaction or a similar type of technique that we used. Um, and we had uh, Jerry Hastings was a, a great guy here with uh, with he works at Slack, and he was uh, I think one of the one of the one of the reasons why I got a look from my boss. Uh, I think Jerry said you need to check this guy out. And uh, so I owe him a lot. And then uh, guys in the audience, Daniel Ratner, TJ, Joe, these guys were uh, instrumental in terms of how to analyze the data and set up the optical lasers. So I couldn't have done it without them. And then lastly, our CGI specialist. It's, uh, he, he, this is our George Lucas. Pro, uh, Adam Kierander is a professor at University of Edinburgh. And he was the, uh, developed the algorithms and the ways to look at these molecules as they evolve kind of in this big, bl big black box computer. Uh, and it was able to really put motion to our molecular movie. And so I couldn't have done it without him. And so I thank you again for your attendance and your interest in our nice little molecular movies. So thank you.
Mike, thank you very much. We have time for questions. So for the questions, there, some of Mike's colleagues are out there running microphones. Um, this is being recorded. So wait to be called on and wait till you have a microphone and then ask your question. Okay, who, please? Go ahead. Okay, I'm just wondering, have you taken pictures in such short amount of time and as using such high energy, will um, uncertainty principle play any role here? Yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, because you can never know the, the, the position of, a, say, an electron uh, with respect to time, absolutely. Uh, so there is definitely some smearing and, and quantum mechanical things going on in the molecule itself. Uh, but in the time frames that we're looking at, um, it, it doesn't play too much, uh, I would say, uh, in terms of the motions of electrons. Uh, we're not at that level yet, I would say. I apologize, my chemistry is really rusty. Um, so is mine. <laughs> so when, when, when there are bonds between atoms, there's energy that's manifested in that bond. And what you're showing is a bond breaks, and a very small but finite time later, another bond is reestablished. So how does that energy manifest during that interval between the bonds? Sir, the... Uh so the bond breaks and it stays broken, uh, typically. So uh, as the molecule is, it gets excited uh, by this ultraviolet laser, uh, there is different types of, as the molecule, uh, what we're looking at is what's called a structural reorganization. So there's these, uh, the bonds break, the bonds can then rotate, uh, but at the same time they're rotating, they're vibrating, and all these different, and this energy goes, is burned off into what are called degrees of freedom. And these degrees of freedom act like big rotations, and as these hydrogens are moving around, well, the hydrogens need to push too, and this is how the energy is kind of spent through that molecule. So there's, if you use the properly tuned optical uh, UV laser light, that you don't whack it so much, the molecule just blows apart. You get it just kind of like you just tune it just a little bit um, and get these bonds breaking. You can easily, reliably control how much energy you put in and how, much, how this molecule and then can unravel. If you put in a lot of optical laser light, you'll blow it up. May I call that kinetic energy of a, of a sort for... Yeah, absolutely. It's internally okay. converted energy, yeah. And so you, you, the, the molecule absorbs, you can, you can call it... Sure. Hi. Um, so I, sort of, ooh, sorry. <laughs> I sort of get um, X-ray crystallography, right, when things are solid. Mm -hmm. I really don't get how you can get anything meaningful out of all the gas things just kind of wandering around and be totally smeared out. How, does, how do you get anything out of that? Because mm -hmm. um, uh, the, how I said, the, how the molecules are generally uh, tumbling around. Um, but the laser pulse that we utilize, the ultraviolet laser pulse, um, has a polarization to it. And so these molecules have what's called a dipole moment. So it's like if you had a big magnet, there's a north and a south pole to the molecule. And as this molecule is running and tumbling around, just free, free fall in, uh, in, in space, and the as the optical laser light excites that molecule, the electric field of that laser interacts with the dipole moment of the molecule, and it preferentially aligns it just ever so slightly. But it's not enough to get like a crystal structure. And so if you can tee the molecule up perfectly, then the molecule will see the laser light purely, and you'll have a good degree of alignment. Uh, but you know, in some cases, the dipole moment could be a, a little bit uh, askew of the polarization of the laser. So, but when the optical laser light is, is absorbed, it, it, it's locked in it like a, it's a cross product, it's called. And so the molecule preferentially absorbs the laser light in one way. And so it kind of sits it up, gently. I'm, I'm curious, oh, and Hoffman, yeah. and, and their rules of symmetry that would um, predict how reactions of this sort would take place. I, I'm wondering how your results shed light on the Woodman-Hoffman rules and whether they're valid and can be used to predict other reactions of this general sort. Oh, they're absolutely valid. Uh, like we, uh, uh, I, I'm not an organic chemist. Uh, my wife is, uh, <laughs> so maybe she could tell you. Uh, no, but uh, def definitely this type of reaction, uh, the electrocyclic series or paracyclic type of studies 
uh, that were pioneered by Woodward uh, and, and Hoffman uh, are definitely, they're, they're substantiated uh, looking at these type of structures. And that's not only just this type of cyclohexadiene ring opening. There's also uh, rotations about double bonds, uh, so. still being molecules acting like molecular switches. Uh, these are all type of uh, ring opening, or these are this type of classification that, of, of, of reactions that, that Woodward and Hoffman made. Com verified for sure. So we're, still okay. We're, kind of we're okay. We're okay for wet, wet bench chemists. You're good. And, uh, the physicist got a hold of it, and it, it's good. Would, would you hazard a guess on how long it'll be before you'll look at photosynthesis? Already being looked at. Uh, absolutely. Um, and so... There are two great groups uh, that are, we're, we're, we're fortunate to have uh, u utilize our, our, our facility here. A group from Berkeley and a group from uh, ASU in Germany, actually. Um, they are very close. Um, I don't know. I, 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 I'm a betting man, uh, and, and the thing, what they're, what they're trying to do is track uh, like the photosynthetic steps in this Koch cycle and watch, uh, the, watch this uh, around this manganese atom uh, and how this progresses through, this charge goes through. Um, if I were a betting man, which I am, I guess whoever f solves that structure is going to win a Nobel Prize, and that will be done here. I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to hazard a guess, Mike. I'm curious about the computational requirements for what you're up to. This is a you picked a rather s simple molecule for good reasons. Do, have you forecasted what? computational requirements are going to be uh, necessary as you go up to try to get at proteins or huge <laughs> yeah but oh, the proteins are huge uh, um, I have no uh, on the scalability um, I guess I don't have a, an extremely good handle on it but um, there uh, was a large computing facility in the UK and I believe it's called uh, um, uh, I'll forget. I'll, I'll, I'll think of it. Uh, I'll think of it a bit. So this is where these large superconducting cluster or these cluster computers. Uh, this is where these calculations were run. Um, up the road here in Berkeley, NERSC uh, is a huge computational facility, and to run something of on the order of peptides and proteins that have hundreds of more electrons, many, many more electrons, it just scales non-linearly. So it's a very an exponential growth in the no amount of computation. Now I have no good grasp. TJ possibly could these tell These are you. already petascale computations to, to do the movie that, you, that we saw. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. These are already petascale computations. Yeah, yeah, yes, many. To do the movie that we saw. Yeah, yes. Uh, to, to, I, I just hate to have you be able to take the pictures but not calculate the motions. It's, uh, they, they go hand in hand, that's for sure, uh, definitely for sure. Yes. Hi. Hello. Thank you for talking about liquid chemists versus gas chemists. <laughs> um, how do you reconcile the difference between like the 50% of uh, liquid chemists saying that the bond is breaking and 90% of the gas chemists? Thank so, you so much. Yeah, no, absolutely. So um, to, to repeat that, it's like why, wh why can't we resolve 90, like what I would claim is these molecules should open up 90% of the time uh, as, a, as a looking at it as a chemist or a physicist, whereas a liquid bench chemist might look at it as a 50% of the time. One, um, it's our resolution. And so uh, right now, in all the trajectories that we see and that we were able to comp compute, about 60% of them open and about 40% of them don't open. Um, if we get the spatial resolution that we're seeking uh, to, to know the nearest neighbors better and those, dis those distances better and all the length scales across how each individual atoms occur, we'll have a better, I think, I think we'll, the, the picture will, will, will become more clear. At the same time, uh, the way we also increase spatial resolution yeah. is we limit the amount of molecules that the x-rays can see. So the, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the case that I showed you today, the x-rays went through a, a vessel. Remember, we saw this green bubbly vessel with the cyclohexadiene kind of bubbling through there. Uh, to put some length to that, there was about um, 13 millimeters, or about the size of a penny. And so if you imagine the x-rays that are super small, this 10 billionth of an, a meter, as they zoom through this uh, penny-sized vessel, uh, it can interact with many, 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 many uh, uh, atoms, or I'm sorry, many, many molecules on the order of like 10 to the 12. So many, 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 million, million uh, molecules. Well, the case is when they detect on the de when they get detected by the detector, where they're generated along that penny length can smear out where that wiggle is detected. That was that tells you about the distance. 
So if you sharpen that line up and, what, and you try to work to the uh, idea of have it, having one single molecule interact with the X-ray beam, that's where you need to go. People are doing that, but in the gas phase, it's extremely difficult, but we can try to work there. Yeah. Yes, sir? Uh, if you carry out the analogy between the molecules and the <laughs> So I imagine the practical application for this ultimately might be in pharmaceuticals or material science. So how far away do you think we are from using these molecular movies for those? Sure. Um, I would say not far. I mean, like we already saw, there were some, uh, we, we, we looked at uh, how, um, how molecules in our brain can signal one another. And so these are these, are these, type, of, uh, of uh, these type of reactions can be probed. So there was a, a recent result that I didn't show uh, talking about uh, the structural changes of how arrestin um, uh, interplays. Uh, there was a really big, uh, nice, nice, nice paper. So that's how drugs are kind of act actively delivered in modern day pharmaceuticals. And so uh, we can study those molecular changes. In terms of material science, it's already done here. Uh, but in terms of molecular movie, I don't believe there's anything done on that, th that type yet. For an example, we can look at uh, uh, novel materials that uh, are, are, could, could potentially be superconducting materials. And so this is like a lossless way to put enter electricity from one side to another across these really couture, very custom, custom uh, materials. And if you pump it with a different type of laser, you can watch like these channels form and let these electrons flow freely. And we can do that now, and so that's a material study uh, that we can do here. Um, are you planning to like um, do like these studies on like amino acids and how they come together to form a protein? That would be an absolutely great question. So if you didn't hear that was like, can we watch basically a chemical reaction occur? Um, and that is my hope to watch a, if you if you can if you can envision a, mul a, a liquid jet of one protein and a liquid jet of another interact in one area, and then you can probe watch these, these bombs break, uh, form. That would be killer. Uh, that was, that's, a gr that's a great question. Uh, and yes, I think there can be these recombinant sources that can put one, like a, a re a two reactants together and make a product and watch that product form. I think we can do it. Um, time frame, <laughs> it's, uh, LCLS will make it hard, but LCLS2 would make that a little bit easier of a measurement because you have more x-rays coming in one second, so you can build statistics more. What about like the amino acids like bonding with each other to make the peptide? Yes. Yeah. yeah, look at that. Yeah, I, well, I, uh, not yet. I haven't, we haven't seen that yet, but I think in, in these type of uh, reactions, uh, or those type of reactions could once, uh, could in the future be probed. Short time. Well, within your lifetime, I bet. Um, okay. I ah, have you got mic. your mic. <laughs> yeah, I finally got it. <laughs> okay. Uh, my question is this. If you carry out the analogy between the molecule that you studied and vitamin D, mm -hmm. What is happening if vitamin D behaves kind of the same way? What is the change in function that results from the fact that you start with a, a cyclic, uh, uh, a benzene ring or something like that, mm -hmm. and you end up with an open one? Why is the open one, what, what, how is the function of the open one changing? Because obviously we need the light to open it up so we get the vitamin D. So what is the change in function of the vitamin that opens, of the, of the ring that opens? Okay, let me get this set up for you. So you're, you want to ask the function of this bond breaking. Yes. If it did not break, what would happen? No, what I'm saying is that we know, you, you explained, it breaks. Mm -hmm. So since it breaks, and that is the end product that makes vitamin D, how is the function of that open bond changing in your body? Oh. Why is it different? Sure, sure, sure. Um, so I'm, I am, I'm going to, like, like the gentleman said, it's, his chemistry was a little rough. Well, my biology is even worse. And so, <laughs> uh, so basically, uh, this allows basically electrons to pass from one, one side of the molecule to another. Um, if, if the electrons are charged and localized along a, a backbone where you see these, these lines, yeah. these lines are double bonds. So this is where two bonds or uh, two carbons make two intersections with one another. Uh, can have things. So if you have uh, a charge localization, 
and there's a pocket of electrons localized around this ring. When you pop it open, it is like a, it's like a, a wire. The charge can flow, so it's charge transfer, I would, that I is believe. That provides the function of the vitamin D uh, after, after the molecule has been electrolyzed. I would believe so. I would have to look, I'll have to, I'll have to get back to you on that for 100% for certain, but I believe it's something close to that uh, mechanics, yeah. With regard to that picture, does the uh, picture on the right, on my right, uh, does it unfold at that point in time so that the two carbon heart? Good question. Um, atoms are not as close as they're really shown. Sure. Um, as far as, as if you were to allow the progress this molecule, uh, let it, uh, if you were to take a picture of it at a later time, um, it could potentially uh, rotate about this bond. Uh, would it serve the same functionality? I don't know. But, but in terms of there's enough energy in the bond being broke and this molecule able to flop around, yes, it could rotate. Now, what that, how that plays with the, the biology of what's happening in our body, I have no clue. <laughs> Safe to say that. Um, so you had a... Uh you, you only saw a 60% uh, uh, opening, but you think that's, that that's due to smearing, the smearing out and that's 90%. Let's say, but uh, if, that's, if that narrows, uh, if after you, you get a more accurate measurement, um, you don't meet your 90% your prediction, right? If it, if, it's, if it turns out to be something else, I mean, what would that, what would that imply? But the yeah, gas there, chemist got it wrong, I think, guess. Yeah. But <laughs> Model. Um, uh, so it, it, it um, let me see, if it were, that result wouldn't rattle the world, <laughs> I would say. Uh, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, wouldn't make it, it wouldn't make us come to a stop. It would make us uh, rethink type of gas phase chemical reaction dynamics. Uh, you know, stuff that uh, potentially could happen like in the atmosphere of how carbon, hydrocarbons react uh, and functionality of the molecule. But in terms of, since there are already some good error bars on it already with 90%, is it 90%, is it 95%, is it 92%? It's, it's roughly 90%. Um, it would just uh, serve for better models of how these, uh, how these reactions actually progress through nature. Uh, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't make the world stop turning. So let's take two more questions. Anyone? Oh. There you go. Yeah. Thank you for taking a second question. Um, you described the scattering and the rings that were created. You had to interpret those, which means you had to validate some kind of interpretation. Is that, done, or I, how much of that is done through a theoretical model of the scattering, or did you shoot multiple molecules of known geometry and compare the outcome? Good question, very good question. Um, there is some black magic to this. Uh, just like we said, there's good CG. Uh, but let me, let me fire up a slide that can show you kind of more of what uh, these wiggles, right? Right. So if you have, uh, you're talking about these, these type of, the, these, these rings here is what you're saying on, on the pattern. Validating the interpretation. Sure. So uh, in how to capture and catch these x-rays that scatter off these cyclohexadiene molecules, we need, to, we need to know the interaction volume and distances very well. So we do shoot uh, known target molecules uh, a priori. So it's used as a calibrant. Uh, it uses, it tells us how far our detector away is. It tells us how the detector panels, like a CCD camera, how they interact and talk with one another. So we use a molecule, before we started taking cyclohexadiene, we used a well-known molecule called sulfur hexafluoride. This molecule, so it's a sulfur with six fluorine atoms hanging off it. This has been uh, used, and the structure of this molecule is known with many, many, many more wiggles than this. <laughs> and so uh, for, for, for synchrotron days, you can, sit, you can sit there, there's a lot of electrons, it scatters really well. So when, it, when you see this pattern emerge from a known structure, you can say, all right, 
I know on this part in my detector that that gives me a, a distance of like two inverse angstrom. Um, so when we, we can also, so that's how you, you physically calibrate the system in, in terms of space uh, with one molecule to another. But there are computational programs out there that you say, all right, I want to measure what the pattern of this molecule, the scattered, like the x-ray pattern, the, the, the billiard pattern, what this is going to look like if just by itself. And you can do, you can do ways, you can, you can put motion to it too. This is called time-dependent density functional theory uh, and these, all these different type of quantum mechanical ways to look at this molecule in a computer. Um, we did play with those too, for sure, because uh, we needed to see uh, the structure on, on the screen once we analyze that data and tease the data out, like, do we have it or we don't have it? And if we don't have it, why? And if we do have it, then send up a rocket and we're happy. And so thankfully, we, the, the latter happened. Uh, but yeah, so it's a good play uh, in terms of, uh, we do use some calibrants first uh, before we get to the nitty gritty, for sure. I got you right behind. <laughs> um, I'm trying to do the math in my head, but if you say the wavelength of the ultraviolet light's about one nanometer. No, uh, about two, two, 267 nanometers. Close okay. Uh, oh, okay. I thought you were way off that end. Well, and your pulse is one femtosecond. So how many wavelengths is that? It's almost down to one wavelength or something like that? <laughs> no. Uh, Are you saying in frequency? The difference between the UV and the X-ray, I think, is the... Oh, okay. Oh, the yeah, difference yeah. between the... So the wavelength of a... A, a femtosecond is a micron. Yeah. Okay. So there's still a lot of wavelengths. You still got okay. about three. So uh, a, 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 the UV light that, was, that shined, that excited the molecule, had about 260, 270 nanometers, uh, or that would be 0.2, no, 0.2 angstrom, right? And so uh, it was, it's much longer. Okay. So. Okay, well, let's thank Mike again. So we'll be around here for some time if you have, want to come down and ask more questions. Also, the people running the microphones are from Mike's group, so you can ask.